know, the, the Four Shine story is, is a big report. You know, it, it took us three years, and, and actually one year to complete the report in Chinese, and then two years in English. You know. so, so the report was, uh, I mean, is actually more than 200 pages. But what I'm actually trying to discuss today is the part that relates to uh, what I call financial repression. A and uh, I think it is related to the conference scene, you know, financial inclusion. But uh, I, I would just uh, uh, use some of the data uh, to show the, how serious the uh, you know, financial repression in China is. Uh, and that, of course, have implications for you know, e e equality, and also uh, resource allocation. Uh, so the, uh, I will go through quickly, uh, you know, the the, uh, the basic messages from the study, but I will focus on uh, a few numbers. Uh, the uh, actually the, the, the I will actually skip this. You know, the, the, uh, we developed the framework to discuss about China, and and the uh, the basic uh, ideas that. The, uh, Chinese regions, they are competing with each other, cities are competing with each other, uh, but guided by the central authorities. So that this is the dynamic system <coughs> which is behind the, the success of the uh, last 35 years. And the, the institutions are evolving because the cities are competing not just for money, talent, projects, but also competing on how to change the rules of the game. Like uh, Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, Shanghai Free Trade Zone, and now the uh, you know five Free Trade Zones, uh, and and this generates uh, what the political scientists you know are interested you know in this uh, central local relation dynamics, uh, and, and and this is actually uh, the basic uh, framework we're trying to uh, understand one particular city in China, and from that city trying to see what are the growth models in China. Uh, so this is this is uh, the big the background, and the, one of the messages we got from the study is that the, the uh, usually we're trying to understand what is stable as the market, and say oh, maybe we should be in the middle. That's a, a lot of debate, uh, especially for economists, political scientists that know more about this. I'm sure you know, and but in fact you know after we, our study we basically see that the. the most useful way is to see government and uh, the state and the market as the two sides of the same coin. Because basically, the quality of states depends on, uh, determines the quality of the institutions governing the market. And that determines the quality of the market. Uh, and the key is really three functional role of the institutions. One is define property rights. The other is create a platform for exchange. The last one is very important that, uh, right now in China is really the resolution you know, of disputes. You know, for example, bankruptcy. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the judicial system. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so, so when the institutions are evolving, which actually reduces what we call transaction cost, then the competitiveness of the economy improves. Yeah. So that, that's basically institutional economics. Uh, and then there, there will be state market dynamics because sometimes state do something pretty good, sometimes not good, and the market has the same, you know, tendency. And, and uh, when they do work well, you know, we got a miracle. When they do work well, you got a collapse. You know, so that this is a very simple, uh, you know, uh, straightforward uh, kind of uh, idea. But trying to focus on the uh, the role of the state in the market, market, how they co collaborate, how they, you know, interact. Uh, but what really, uh, you know, within a very short period of time, I want to tell you is actually four surprises from this study. Uh, the first surprise is really the, the outstanding performance of one Chinese city. Uh, uh, I will actually skip that. The second surprise, uh, I, I will come back later. Uh, the, uh, okay, the, you see, this, this graph, you know, shows the, uh, the steep one shows the, this one city with seven million population, uh, and the uh, the flatter one uh, is China. Uh, and but what is more striking is this table. This is the table uh, of sixteen cities in China. 
among the 16 cities in China, uh, this is ranked by population. And most people here, I'm sure you know Shanghai, you know Beijing, you know Tianjin, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Wuhan, Qingdao, Hangzhou, Nanjing, and even Ningbo. But how many of you know Foshan? Huh? No, right? So great. So this is the surprise to us, you know. Nobody knows about the Foshan, but then when you rank the uh, cities, the last table ranked by population. Actually, why I select the 16 cities? These 16 cities are the cities which already become high income economy by World Bank standards. You know, they uh, have more than 3 million population. You know, they have more than 100 million, uh, 100 billion uh, GDP, US dollar. Yeah. So these are the pioneering cities. You know, people are talking about the middle income trap, but some of the cities is already high income. Yeah. But within this sample, small sample, uh, what we have is Foshan ranked by productivity, GDP per capita, you know, ninth. By population is only 11th. And what is more interesting is that the Foshan, you know, 14,647 uh, 14, US dollar per capita GDP is higher than in Beijing and Shanghai. So when we, we're telling people that the Foshan is very productive, uh, productivity is higher than Beijing and Shanghai, people are really scared. You know, I'm saying, uh, are you sure? I, uh, I, I'm, uh, are you sure? Uh, but in fact, uh, McKinsey ranked the Foshan globally the 13th, you know, most competitive uh, cities based on their projected GDP uh, over uh, from 20 uh, uh, to, to 20, uh, 25, I think, yeah. So, so, so th this is a, this is one surprise, you know, yeah. and and there's a lot of uh, numbers. I I, I will try to skip, you know, uh, we don't have time. But basically, this is an industrialized city. The percentage share uh, uh, of uh, industry in the city increased 11 percentage points, while the whole country reduced three percentage points, you know, over uh, like from uh, 78 to. 2012. Yeah. So if you want to see the factory of the world, you know, in China, this is the place. Yeah. Uh, then uh, this is also interesting graph, you know, because of that this is shows the red line shows the uh, the uh, the fixed asset investment uh, of the whole country, and then the, the gold line then basically shows the full shine. So basically, they have very flat, uh, stable, fixed capital investment. Uh, and this is the problem because the, this is actually partly a result of financial repression. They can't get money. Uh, and the, the uh, let me just try to find the, the largely because the, the city is, uh, I'm trying to find the, uh, yeah, SMEs. This is a city with all the SMEs. Uh, so, so, but what I really try, uh, want to show you is this graph. Uh, this is table. Uh, we talked about this fixed capital as an investment, but the more relevant is the loan GDP ratio. You look at this table. This loan GDP ratio for Foshan is 85 percent, 84.9. Uh, then the China as a whole is 121 uh, percent. Uh, so this is the problem. The, the, the Foshan's loan GDP ratio is lower than average. So think about it. a lot of less productive cities in China. They occupy a lot of credit. You see, so th this is uh, the consistent with the fixed capital investment, very low. You know, yeah. So this this is, uh, I mean, th this data is, is what I think is relevant because uh, when we talk about uh, uh, financial uh, uh, repression, uh, basically we are talking about the. the more productive cities, companies cannot get the credit, but less productive they get credit, and that's not fair, and that's also, uh, you know, leading to the so-called inequality. You know, it's 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 a so that this is the crucial, uh, you know, uh, data, uh, uh, and then the second surprise is is really about. Uh, 
uh, you know, the, the so-called the lessons. And then we, we, we try to find some unique uh, reason why Forsyth is doing so well. Uh, but we couldn't find really anything special, you know, uh, except the geography and maybe some history, culture, you know. And, and geography is actually extremely important because Forshan actually has, uh, you know, let me show you a number. Yeah, this is a number. Half of the population is from outside. So what it means is that, the, you know, when China is moving towards market economy, for <coughs> money projects, they all come to, you know, more productive places. Because you can pay, get paid better, you know, and the actual living standard is higher. You know, uh, for example, the cost of housing, this is affordability, you know. If you want to hire 10,000 engineers, you, you can't set your companies in Shenzhen or Shanghai, it's too expensive. Yeah. But you can set in Foshan. Foshan's price, you know, I just got back from Foshan uh, uh, two weeks ago, is only one-fifth of those in Shenzhen and Guangzhou, you know. And, and if you look at this, uh, the cost of housing, the this is the cost of 100 square meter housing, uh, you know, divided by, uh, you know, GDP per capita. So what it means is that the, the GDP per capita is a proxy for income, and then how many years GDP per capita you need to buy 100 square meter housing, right? And if you look at this data, four sign is nine years, and and the the trouble is that the Chinese average is 14 years, Shanghai is like a, you know. Uh, 16 years and Beijing is you know, almost 18 years and Hong Kong comparable data is 72 years yeah so so this this is uh, 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 right uh, and uh, let, let me see yeah uh, so the uh, another feature of four is that, that when you go there they have more than 30 clusters, specialized industrial clusters, you know, uh, but plug into global supply chain. You go there, you, you see the largest furniture, retail and wholesale in the whole world. The first time the, the, the appliance, you know, factories, they produce uh, the largest share of microwaves in the whole world, you know. So, so this, this, is, uh, this is the uh, a result from the, you know, uh, back to early years, you know, China has this collective farm, and then the land was distributed quite evenly among the communities. And then when they started this industrialization and uh, uh, urbanization, they basically they delegated the authority, local authority, to the lowest level, village, and then township. So, so, so you got a distribution of uh, like this, you know, everywhere you, you see factories. Yeah. But this becomes a problem in recent years, and this is also related to financial depression, <coughs> because you, you, when, when you, uh, a few years ago, before 2008, you go, you go to, uh, you, you, you go to Foshan, you don't have, Foshan does not have downtown, you know, because everywhere is factories. And this is not conducive to, to service industry, yeah, uh, because service needs to have house, you know. And as cost of labor, you know, cost of land, everything goes up, you know, the, there's huge challenges. And, and the basically they need to invest, yeah, they need to, you see, they need to invest in downtown if they want to shift to a high value area, they invest in basically more, uh, much better uh, environments, yeah, for service and also for high uh, value added uh, production. And, and the, the, when we ask the mayor, this is sort of surprise. We're trying to find out that really, uh, uh, by the way, you know, this project uh, has been collaborating with 25 researchers from the National Development and Reform Commission. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, 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 massive uh, mobilization of resources, you know. And, and the, the, uh, we're trying to dig out, you know, is there anything special? So we can draw and then to teach others, right?
But what, what really, the only thing really we, we, we struck is that the, is the really the competition. The, the, the for China is not special to Amazon. It's not the uh, capital city. You know, it's a uh, uh, they have to try by themselves. And fortunately, you know, the uh, for example, the infrastructure for San built. Uh, it, it was the first city <coughs> they <coughs> built the toll uh, toll bridge in China. They built a, uh, a ring road. So financed, locally financed. The first ring road in Foshan is almost the exact same as the fifth ring in Beijing. For those of people who've been to Beijing, the fifth ring, you know, yeah. And so they have a lot of this uh, PPP, what the Chinese are trying to, I mean, the, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank they're trying to do, right? The, this slogan is from Foshan. If you want to get rich, build roads first. President Xi Jinping actually used it when he talked about the, you know, one bad one road. You know, use exactly the words. You, know, you want to get rich, you have to build the roads first. Uh, uh, but since two, 2008, there has been a massive build up in Foshan for two new cities. This is a small picture here. There's one is the Foshan Sino German Industrial Service Zone. This is a massive, uh, you know, the, the city has a central park. It's more than, it, almost the same size as the central park in New York. And they have two cities, two new cities and two central park. Yeah. And I just came back, I uh, brought the top exactly from Walmart, you know, number two all the way to like, uh, uh, you know, uh, more than 10 people to, to, uh, to see, you know, the urbanization, you know, all the, all the issues. You know. they, they were really shocked. You know. Yeah. The, but this is a serious problem because you see, when you build these cities, you go there, they have eight mile, like a green belt, just like Singapore, you go there. Uh, and they have a lot of real estate development. Uh, the trouble is that if every city in China, there's 300 cities in China, do the same thing, <laughs> you're in big trouble. This is the situation right now. Uh, because you see the, 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 the people will choose. And when people choose Foshan, Foshan becomes a great city. But when people leave Foshan, it becomes ghost town, you know? And, and then the, the reason a lot of remote cities, third tier, fourth tier cities, they're trying to copy, it's because they, uh, this is a financial repression. Basically, they got subsidies. They think that the land is free, you know? So, so, so they, they invite the best architecture from Shanghai and from Europe, say, okay, why build the most beautiful house? But nobody goes, because when people decide where to work, live, there's a lot of other factors which you kind of don't know, you know, and, and somehow geography is, is the most important factor, right? So that's the lessons we, we, we learned, you know. Uh, this is another city which is financial hub. This is, uh, I'm actually on the board of HSBC, you know, the HSBC, you know, the biggest uh, back office operations is here in Foshan. Yeah. And, and, and the basically, the, this city is bigger than Beijing's financial street. Yeah. So, so, so this case basically, uh, you know, tells us that, uh, oh, I'm try not trying to promote Foshan, you know, because we, we, when we do this, select the case, not trying to promote Foshan. You know? The Foshan did not pay us anything. They didn't invite us. We just, just selected one. Yeah. And this is very important because the old problem we see in Foshan is a problem for the whole country. There are three most important problems, three or four, you know. One is the debt problem I, I, I talked about. You know, if everyone is like Foshan, China is in serious trouble, you know, because you, you just build uh, wrongly, you know. And the other is that the, uh, the SMEs, small, medium-sized companies, they cannot get the credit. And, and Foshan is a typical case. It's full of SMEs. They're paying interest rate at 20% annual interest rate. They're still surviving. Yeah. But that's financial repression. Yeah. Uh, and then the most serious problem, in my view, is really pollution. You know, especially water pollution. Yeah. You know, Foshan is just, uh, geographically, it's just about Guang, uh, Hong Kong, next to Guangzhou, not far from Guangzhou. And basically, 
the Perlio Delta actually has been very clean because the Perlio Delta, the, the, the east side of Perlio River, originates from hometown, you know, Jiangxi. And many, many years ago, the Chinese government, in order to ensure they send clean water to Hong Kong, they make sure no polluting industries are upstream. And in the west part of the Pearl River, basically the state of virgin land, no industry, very clean. So all the pollution is actually coming from the Pearl River Delta around Guangzhou, Foshan, and all this. Yeah. And, and this is very serious. And, and so, so basically, I brought the Walmart people there. Basically, they, it's about the water, you know, had to clean up the water. Yeah. When we first go there, you know, we went there, they build a massive amount of water processing factories, but no pipelines to connect to this dirty water, you know, no pipelines. Yeah. Because the, the, the industry spread so much across the, the, the you know, water. But last time, a few weeks ago, you know, we went there, they already started to build the pipelines to connect into the major uh, industrial hubs. But they are also building freestanding water cleaning facilities, you know. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, I uh, also you know, uh, uh, consulted, you know, BASF, the German, you know, chemical company, you know. They, they, they were planning to bring the whole, you know, the leadership team, you know, basically to, to have experience in Foshan and trying to figure out how to fix that. Because this problem was the same problem for Germany many years ago. And Germany fixed all of them, you know. So there's hope that, and, and the, but the, the, the thing is, you know, a lot of this kind of things, you know, it needs to do, but the, the, the trouble, this is about pollution. You need finance, yeah. So the, the real problem now is that the, every city claim they, they, <laughs> they are like Fosa. Yeah. So, so, so really, this is, and of course, the market will decide, you know, right, which one, right. So, the, so, so that's why, uh, from this case, you know, we can see the, the financial repression, you know, because of the inefficiency of the financial sector, you know, and we, we got this, these problems, yeah. Uh, I, I think I will stop here. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I really enjoyed the presentation. It was actually a lot more helpful than I, I had seen the PowerPoint before, but it's a very long PowerPoint. So I wasn't sure what the points of emphasis would be, but I think I'm getting a much clearer picture uh, from the talk. And uh, Forshan is a really interesting case. I was in Forshan actually late last year and also was really impressed just by the level of industrial development. And uh, I, I sense also a very much a forward thinking attitude, trying to solve problems as they arise and think about what, what the future is going to be like there. Um, so what do we learn from the Foshan case? I think uh, maybe you're still trying to figure out what we've really learned. I mean, I think there's, some, there's obviously a lot of interesting aspects to the story. It's always hard to uh, figure out what you can learn from one single case because it's not a direct comparison to some other case where you can see what were the differences. There is reference, of course, to the rest of China. And uh, I think there are also probably meaningful comparisons to other places in Guangdong. Um, but let me just uh, say a few things about the economic features of this story that I think are interesting. And then some, some comments about the institutional aspects of the story. Uh, and then think about what we can learn from Foshan uh, for the rest of China. So uh, the presentation laid out very clearly, this is a high growth story, uh, a place that has gone from basically a rural area to full urbanization, uh, very rapid industrial development focused on small and medium scale enterprises, formerly township and village enterprises, which in Chinese history were collectively owned enterprises, but then were all privatized and well known for furniture in particular, the world, uh, world's largest wholesale furniture uh, market. Um, and then the point that was emphasized, and I also have emphasized here, is that uh, if you just look at the data, it suggests very low levels of fixed ac asset investment relative to GB GDP and low levels of borrowing credit relative to GDP. And uh, so that raises a question. I mean, on the one hand, you know, uh, the presentation emphasized that this is financial repression that's very costly. On the other hand, you say, hey, such high growth, such success. Maybe they overcame this constraint and it wasn't binding. We won't know what would have happened <laughs> if they had access to more uh, credit. Um, and then I also thought it was interesting in the tables that uh, 
Shenzhen even has a much lower fixed asset to GDP rate. So uh, for Shenzhen, the ratio of fixed asset investment to GDP was 32%, and in Shenzhen it was 18%, which was by far the lowest, although the credit to GDP ratio was the lowest in uh, for Shan. But this suggests that, um, and maybe if we had data on Dongguan or some of the other real manufacturing success stories in Guangdong, it would be maybe a similar story to for Shan in some respects. And I'm wondering, uh, well, this suggests a much higher return to capital because they're getting higher industrial growth with less investment. That means they're using the existing in investment much more efficiently than other parts of China. And we know from many other studies uh, in China that uh, capital is still allocated very inefficiently and much of it is allocated to the state-owned sector, which has a very much lower return than the private sector. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, you think that's enough to explain this difference in efficiency return rate. Is it just the fact that in Guangdong, basically the private sector is dominant, whereas in other parts of China, state sector is much more prevalent. And so if we just, if we could measure the amount of private capital or private fixed investment to private uh, industry or GDP, <laughs> maybe that ratio might be similar in other parts of China. Or is there something else about how capital has been allocated uh, here. Is it also efficiency not just coming from the state banks, which you know are the main lender in China, but from other alternative financing vehicles? Uh, or maybe this in, a lot of this investment is also self-financed and it's just a higher return. So I'm curious to, for more kind of uh, speculation at least about what drives this higher return to capital in Foshan and perhaps other places in, in Shenzhen. Now, if we look at the institutional story, uh, I think there was an emphasis on the complementarity between market orientation and a high quality state. And the state characteristics here include uh, a decentralized system where local government leaders had a lot of freedom to be very activist and develop. This is a well known China story. Uh, in particular, many of these enterprises were formally led by local government leaders when they were collective. So I'm wondering to what extent that was helpful, that we had a lot of local government officials who had some background actually managing enterprises to then when they privatized the enterprises to have not only a close relationship with between government and enterprises, but also have some insight about what the, what the market uh, needs. Just to think of kind of an institutional story that might uh, come out of, of, the, of, of this uh, experience. Um, and then, of course, recent efforts, I think the jury is still out. I mean, the, I think the infrastructure obviously was important. And we see rapid industrial growth in many parts of Guangdong. So I'm not sure if it's just the Foshan Bridge and just the Ring Road, but maybe just being in Guangdong near Hong Kong when exports boom. This is the whole uh, factory of the world growth story for China. And Guangdong has always been the center of it. Um, and then, of course, recently, Li Keqiang has been emphasizing these recent administrative reforms. And I actually had another colleague who did some work in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Foshan, and he said that this administrative reform is also going forward very rapidly. So there's this data recently that many new enterprises are registered in China because it's gotten much easier to register. Um, and of course, that's a very much a market-oriented, decentralized reform. But I think we're not really sure yet what the impact of the more recent ones are. And I thought it was very nice to point out that it's not obvious that this is going to be successful, that the market will dictate. And there's a lot of, uh, you can write a very simple model of regional competition, which actually suggests that uh, there can be a lot of inefficient investment, public investment, in a regional uh, competition framework because everyone's trying to steal the business, draw the investment, and then the losers have made all of these investments that, n that don't get used, right? If you were the central and if you were the central government and you didn't really care where the industry was, you just wanted industry to develop in China, you would probably try to figure out which place has the highest potential and first do all the infrastructure investment there and then not do the <laughs> investment in other places. Uh, so I think I think there is a, um, a lot of issues here. And finally, I think. In terms of the questions, I think most of the questions I have really revolve about what we can learn in terms of thinking about Foshan as a model for China. And 
uh, I think, you know, I agree definitely with this point that Forshan from the description is facing key challenges that all of China is facing. And you know, I think Guangdong province and Forshan are facing these challenges kind of earlier than the rest of China. So how they deal with these challenges really is going to be a very important experience for other parts of China to learn from. And uh, we have this trend of shifting uh, sales from the export market to domestic markets, which seems to be occurring in Forshan. Also, we see slowing industrial growth over time, and then this big challenge to industrially <coughs> up, upgrade, not just to higher, uh, higher value added industry, but also to service sector, high level service sector activity. And uh, these new zones have been created to, to try to affect this type of an adjustment. And I'm, I'm curious uh, whether there's some evidence of success uh, in these efforts. Uh, the statistics seem to suggest there are some, you mentioned HSBC has moved its back, uh, you know, uh, back office work here, and it seems like the economy has diversified. There was another, pro that suggests that there, there is some success in drawing higher value added um, industry and services into the area. But I'm just wondering what else the local government can do and what's going to determine the sets. Of course, it's in, in the end, it's just the market, but for China as a whole, to really industrial upgrade, it really requires a kind of an innovative economy, right? Where uh, you can't just hire cheap labor and produce stuff for export using borrowed technology. You have to start creating new, your own technologies and innovating. And the kind of institutions that would support that, I don't think are city level institutions, right? These are national, provincial level <laughs> institutions on research, on university, linkages to universities. Uh, a lot of things about uh, very high level training of human capital. And so maybe, you know, the, I'm curious to what extent the determinants of sex are even in the control of local leaders at this next stage of development, which is a very different type of, I think, development trajectory than the past stage. So I'll stop there. Uh, before I, uh, any, any questions here from the floor? One or two, maybe? Uh, and then we collect everything at once for all of Okay, I'll leave you with Kishan. <coughs> Thanks. This is building on Albert's comments. The one question I had is to what extent do you think that Foshan has a distinct model of local political economy in China? So we all know about the Wenzhou model based on private sector development, minimal foreign direct investment. We know about the Sunan model, which seems to resonate a little bit with the Foshan model in terms of having a really strong collective sector and close government business relations. But Sunan also um, ended up attracting a lot of foreign direct investment versus the South China Guangdong model, which has attracted a huge amount of overseas Chinese investment, uh, light manufacturing oriented. So that um, one thing I didn't hear in your narrative was how much FDI has Foshan been attracting? Is it overseas Chinese or multinational? And how does Foshan's so-called model compare with other more familiar existing models of political economy in China? Uh, <coughs> the discussion is not so much about Foshan, but about financial repression issue in SMEs. So to what extent is China has been they started to liberalize the deposit? One of the arguments was that most of the large chunk of the lending goes to state-owned enterprises because mm -hmm. deposit rates are fairly low in any case, so they don't have to worry about taking too much more risk and they can lend to <coughs> SOEs and still make a decent profit. So do you think that liberalization of deposit rates is going to lead to less financial depression vis-a-vis -vis the SMEs? Will banks now start taking a bit more risk and start lending to SMEs at relatively higher rates? Thanks for all these comments. Very useful, very good. Uh, the uh, uh, Albert's comment very useful. The you know the purpose of this study is, is really not to trying to show four shines a model. It's really trying to understand at a micro level what are the key parameters. You know, because there the, are the a lot of things. For example, corruption, quite serious in four shine. Uh, yeah, just like other in other places. Yeah, and uh, they are. Uh, pollution, you know, all these this issues. Yeah. Uh, the, but the jury is out. That's a very important point because of the, uh, you know, uh, 
the thing is, you know, if Foshan cannot survive, can any other cities, Chinese cities, survive? I mean, the, 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 the macro cycle. You know? So Foshan becomes extremely important for macro policy making. You know, the, that goes to your question about deposit you know, insurance. The, the issue is not really about deposit insurance. The issue is about that uh, when China is trying to do all the reforms, anti-corruption, cut oversupply, you know, deal with local debt, all those reforms are austerity programs, seriously austerity programs. And then at the same time, you know, the central bank is accumulating four trillion reserves, you know. So, so you, 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 the, the, the problem now is that you, you got the seriously financial repression because the, a lot of well-performing cities, companies, they really need money, like Alibaba. You cannot be listed, uh, Alibaba listed in the U.S., you know. And it, so, so, so that it, it is really the problem. It, it, it's that the macro uh, regulators, when they see a dual-track economy, see the problems, they're trying to fix it. But in fact, they have collateral damages to a lot of this reasonably well performing. But the, the trouble is that the, whether you are good or not, uh, not, it depends. I mean, you need the accountability. Uh, what I call the uh, the accountability risk and the discipline. You know, it, it, it's like a, you, you need the bankruptcy, you know, judicial systems, so that the, if the local government cannot pay or company cannot pay, then you have to find out the ways to you know, force bankruptcy and then release resources, right? And, and also, China is heavily financed by banking. So that's why it now needs to use the stock market, you know, because the stock market is, allows people to take voluntary risk. You know, basically, the unlimited shareholders are taking limited liability risks. That's good for innovation, to take risk, right? But the problem in China is that when the central government figure out that that's a good way. They start to promote it. So the Xinhua news, the people's day to write, encourage people to buy stocks. That you have a problem. You also have that. So, uh, and then the, the, the other question about the political economy model, uh, I think the more, uh, I, I would tend to think that the, the, what we have laid out is a political economy model between central and local. The difference between Foshan and Dongguan and uh, other cities, although important. For example, Dongguan, Foshan's feature is that uh, it actually developed the indigenous industry. But Dongguan is heavily relying on processing. So there's some differences. But you know, my personal view is that the, actually the bigger picture between the central local is very important. Because that, like Albert mentioned, a lot of institutions at the national level, like land, you know, institution, land, land property rights, you know, and the judicial system. So, so the locals, they, they are actually interfaces for households and the companies. But the major institutional parameters, like uh, the party, you know, take care of the, the cutters, those institutions is national level. And those national levels is sometimes constraints, you know, the, 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 the local level innovation. So, so in a way, I, I, I think that the, the, the this case study is helpful for us to understand the, the, the political economy between central and local. Because the central government is always with responsibility of pollution, financial, you know, all these liability problems. But local government is like a landlord because they, they, they occupy the land. They, the land sales is the major revenue for them to build a new city. You know? And so in a way, they are competing, but if the central government does not regulate well, on the externalities like pollution and debt, then the whole country will get into this, you know, crisis and problems. Yeah. Okay, one more question, if there's any, if not. Uh, <coughs>